In this video, we're going to be looking at texture atlases, or sprite sheets. I think texture atlases are actually really fun to work with, but I'll forgive you if you don't make it all the way through this video. I'm going to be covering things that have nothing to do with WebGL, and maybe showing you things that you already understand and know how to do. So it's okay if you bail out partway through this video. But if you do, there's a super important detail that I'll explain fully later that I want to introduce up front so that you won't come away empty-handed. What is this detail? Well, with version 2, WebGL doesn't care about power of 2 texture images anymore. That is, images with a pixel height or width of 128 or 256 or 1024 or whatever. But texture atlases still do, especially if you're working with tiled images. If you're using mipmaps, you have to keep mipmap levels in mind because of texture pollution. You should make sure that each texture in your atlas fits cleanly into a grid that's spaced using power of two. And almost without exception, you must put hard limits on your mipmap chain so that minification doesn't cause pollution in your textures, because it always does. I'll put a link in the description if you want to skip ahead to this part, where I demonstrate this problem. Now, the way I've said it here, it sounds scary, but it's really not. It's just like making sure that your shoes are tied before you go for a walk. Anyway, I'll get into all the nitty-gritty of this in a few minutes. So, texture atlases are not actually a WebGL feature, exactly, but rather a technique used for years initially by necessity in 2D and 3D graphics, which maybe explains why there are so many terms. Texture atlas, sprite sheet, sprite atlas. They're all describing the same technique. Its purpose is simply to reduce the number of textures an application needs to load at once. There are no standards for their use, no image format that you have to use, no data format for your UVs. So really you're completely free to do things however you want. What is a texture atlas? Well, let's take a quick look at some examples. Here's one. Here's an alternate version of that. Here's one for a single animation. Here's one for eight different animations. How about this one, taken straight from Wikipedia? It looks insane, but I promise you it works just fine. So what makes all of these texture atlases is that they are textures that contain other textures. Easy. That should be great news to newcomers, because it means that if you know how to use WebGL textures, you know how to use texture atlases too. There's really no magic to them. At their core, they're basically just a texture image and some UV coordinates. And that's no different from regular textures. Now, what is maybe a little different is that usually you have to generate your own atlases and collect and update all your own matching UV coordinates. But I kind of love this. You have freedom to do it however you want, and customize and optimize things to your exact needs. But why bother, though? These days you're allowed to have more than one texture. Why bother cramming them all into a single image? Well, if you've only got a dozen textures, sure, why bother? But what if it's several dozen, or even hundreds? Well, now you've got a problem, because most hardware simply can't handle that many texture units. You could swap out textures between draw calls, but that is going to hurt. So no, realistically, almost as soon as you've started using multiple textures, you're going to feel a really strong incentive to use texture atlases as well. So uh, let's make one now. Again, this has nothing to do with WebGL, and if you don't care about this part, which is fine, you can skip ahead to this point in the video. Your challenge here is twofold. Produce the atlas image itself and produce the data of the corresponding UV coordinates for each texture in the atlas. And here's the images I'll be using. I found these on kenny.nl. I'll put a link in the description. I have no connection to them, but honestly, check the site out. Free to use, even for commercial use. No registration, no strings attached, not even attribution. So please, just go check them out. They're great. In this case, I'm lucky. That's because all of these images are either 128 by 128 or 64 by 64, which means they're already power of two. As I hinted at earlier, this is super helpful. I'll explain why in a moment. How do you get them all into a single image? That's your choice. 
but it's the sort of thing that you won't do only once, even for a single atlas. Inevitably, usually at the end of your project, you're going to have to return to your atlas again and again to tweak and refine. So please take my advice and stick to a tool chain that either you know well already and is easy to use, or choose one that has a shallow learning curve. Me, I already use the command line tool Image Magic for other things all the time anyways, and it has a command just for this sort of job. So that's what I'm going to use here. But again, do this the way that is most familiar and comfortable to you, and automate it if you can, because nothing, nothing is worse than having to come back to an atlas you made six weeks ago and forgetting how you made it. Now, in this case, I've decided I want to upsize the smaller images so that everything is 128 by 128. It'll make things a bit easier. And I won't lose any quality because it's pixel art already. This command will convert an entire directory of PNGs into a single image of 128 by 128 texture images, arranged in eight columns. The point filter ensures that things remain crisp and pixelated after upscaling. I'm adding a 10 pixel transparent border around each image. If you're not using mitmaps, this is a common format for atlases. Ah, but wait, I am planning on using mitmaps, so let's skip the gutter. This will accomplish that. Okay, I'm, I'm happy with that. So because I made everything with the same dimensions, it means figuring out all the UV coordinates is now much simpler, even if the image is a bit bigger. I'll do this in JavaScript and just run it in the browser console now. In real life, I'd probably write a node script which can generate files and save them to disk and keep the script with my artwork. Building the JavaScript object describing the entire map is simple. I'm going to write out the UV coordinates as floating point values rather than pixel coordinates. Also, normally I'd write out all four UV coordinates, one for each corner of the texture. This can help a lot if you need to adjust or customize things to fix issues with individual textures. But I'll just write out a single UV coordinate marking the top left corner of each texture. I'll need these constants to make my calculations. What the values are will depend on the atlas I'm using. I'll take in all the file names. I've made sure that they're in the same order as they appear in the image. I'll strip the PNG extension and split the string into an array of image names. And now the algorithm. Just figure out the row and column, turn that into a floating point UV coordinate, and write out the resulting JSON string to the console. That string will work. We probably should add information like atlas dimensions, the UV size of each texture, stuff like that. That would make the file more portable. But just for this demonstration, I'll stick to what we have, just the corner coordinates. Save it in its own JSON file, and we're done. We now have an atlas image and a data file that we can use however we want. Now, finally, I get to talk about why I cared so much about Power of 2 earlier. If you watched my video on mipmaps, you'll know that in WebGL 2, textures don't have to be Power of 2. You can make the images in any dimension you want. And that's still true for your actual atlases. But if you're using mipmaps and the images in your atlas aren't arranged using Power of 2, you're asking for trouble. Let me demonstrate this. Remember this? This is from my video on mipmaps, and it's how I like to visualize how mipmaps work as you go up in levels. Let's replace the fish with a texture atlas. Here, each element is 140 by 140, so not power of 2. Going from level 0 to level 1 looks fine, no problem. At level 2, also no problem. But at level 3, you'll notice a small amount of bleed through between some neighboring textures, and every step down the mipmap chain just gets exponentially worse. The reason for this? The images are 140 pixels wide. Half of 140 is 70, half again is 35, half again is 14.5, and you can't have half a pixel. So it means that textures at some point will start sharing texels. It means pollution. Let's switch to an atlas that does use Power of 2 now. These are 64 by 64 with no gutter. And every step along the mipmap chain gives us a nice crisp image, which is perfect. Well, I mean, it's almost perfect. Uh, okay, okay, wait, wait a second. With Power of 2, you can't prevent pollution, you can only delay it? Thankfully, no, 
WebGL allows you to set limits to your mipmap chains. You don't have to start at level zero, and you don't have to go all the way down to a single pixel. Do you remember this function? This is how we set our minification filter. And using different arguments, we can use it to set those limits on our mipmaps. Call it with texture max level and 7, then no mipmap texture beyond level 7 will ever be used. If it needs to sample from level 0 or 1 or 6 or 7, no problem. The sampler still has access to those texture images, but for smaller fragments, WebGL will stick to level 7, which is perfectly fine. It's exactly what we want. Interestingly, remember how our non-Power of 2 atlas was OK for levels 0, 1, and 2? Well, if you have no other choice, you can still set texture max level to 2. You may encounter aliasing issues when things get really small, but you don't have to worry about pollution, so that's good. So my recommendations are, if you know you definitely don't need mipmaps, you can ignore all this. Otherwise, if possible, space your atlas textures along a power of two grid. Figure out the level where pollution becomes a problem, and use text parameter i with texture max level to prevent your program from sampling from polluted mipmap levels. There's another common problem you'll encounter, especially with tiled atlas textures. See the seam between the tiles? Okay, it could be in the atlas image itself. If you resize an atlas image even a little bit, this kind of artifact is going to happen. But if you're sure, like I am, that the texture image is good, that the tiles break evenly every 128 pixels or whatever, then the problem is the UV coordinates. In cases like this, you want to move your UV coordinates in towards the center of the texture, usually no more than a third or a half of a pixel. Don't worry, you won't be losing any resolution if you do this. Actually, the opposite will happen. The problem now is that you're oversampling the atlas and capturing color information from neighboring textures. In other words, your UV coordinates are too far out. Pulling them away from the edge towards the center means that you're capturing only the texels that you're actually interested in. So just pull back until the seam just disappears, and you should be fine. Now let's look at a quick application that uses our Atlas files. As always, this is not the way I'd recommend that you structure your code. It's more just to demonstrate the simple mechanics of loading atlases and getting them on the screen. So here's our starting point. It's a simple program. Our vertex shader takes in two attributes, position and texture coordinate, and sends out a texture coordinate as a varying. And our fragment shader takes in a sampler and that same texture coordinate as a varying. We've, we've seen all this before. I've prepared some vertex data and put it into its own dedicated array. I'll show you what this data draws in a second. And I've put most of the remaining WebGL code in its own async function. Async because we'll be loading a couple of files asynchronously. Inside, we're simply populating our buffer for position data. And we're preparing our texture coordinate buffer, but not populating it just yet. The end result is four black squares arranged in a single large square. It's black right now because we've not uploaded any texture yet. Note that you can't see any border between the four squares. Remember this because it's important. Now, let's just see our squares drawn one at a time. We're getting a warning that we need a texture, so why don't we set that up now? Again, we've done this before. The image dimensions are 1024 by 2048. This happens to be power of two, but it doesn't have to be. The images inside the atlas should be, but not the atlas image itself. I'm sending an image that doesn't exist yet, so let's load this now. Okay, we get another warning, this time because we've not said what we want to do about mipmaps. We want to generate them this time for sure. No more errors. We actually are seeing the texture here, but all of the texture coordinates are zero, so we're seeing only a single clear pixel at the bottom left of our atlas image. Now let's load our atlas data. Again, this is asynchronous. Instead of returning a promise explicitly, we'll mark the function as async and use fetch to get our data. You know what? Instead of just returning the data, why don't we create a factory function that loads the data and returns a function that fetches the texture coordinate by name? 
Let's see if this is working correctly. Yeah, looks good. Okay, now we have a float32 array already for storing our texture coordinates. We should populate that now with actual data. You can use the set method for JavaScript typed arrays like float32 array. It takes in the data of any numerical array and puts it where you tell it to in that typed array. That'll work, but we need all six UV coordinates, a total of 12 floats. So our lookup function isn't going to cut it. We know the corner UV of our texture in our atlas, and our texture coordinates will be based on this corner. The horizontal component will be either u, or u plus a width value, and the vertical component will be either v, or v plus a height value. Which we use depends on our position coordinates and how they're laid out. In my case, it will look like this. Because we didn't include this information in our atlas data file, we have to hard code the width and height values. Great, that works perfectly. Now the other squares. Nice. Okay, notice how before we didn't have any line separating our black squares, but now we see a faint line between our tiles. Like I said before, this could be an issue with your atlas image, but in this case I'm certain it's not. So let's pull our UV coordinates in towards the center of the texture. And in this case, a quarter of a pixel's worth of UV padding is all that was needed. Okay, obviously nobody's going to win any game awards with this system, but it does show you the barest basics of texture atlases, and I really hope that you can take some of the concepts that you've seen here and put them to use in your own applications.